We're in there in the last chapter, chapter 52. Next week, we will be in a book which I think is more, most likely written by Jeremiah, and uh, that's the book of Lamentations. And so we will, uh, we'll just look at that in one, one lesson. Uh, it is a lament, but uh, it kind of ties in with what we're talking about this morning uh, as well. In fact, uh, these words, how deserted lies the city, once so full of people, bitterly she weeps at night, tears on her cheeks after affliction and harsh labor, Judah has gone into exile. The enemy laid hands on all her treasures. She saw pagan nations enter her sanctuary. This is why I weep and my eyes overflow with tears. No one is near to comfort me, no one to restore my spirit. That's the book of Lamentations in chapter 1. And uh, as I said, most likely Jeremiah writes those words and he's mourning for this city that he loved and has now lost. The same events are described here in the last chapter of the prophecy of Jeremiah. And uh, this book, uh, I mean, we go through a whole prophecy and we think, you know, well, this, is a, this is a bad way to end as we get to this. But there is a hint of hope that we'll see in just a moment. But if you look at uh, chapter 51 of Jeremiah and verse 64, the last verse of that chapter, um, it says, he's given instructions, you know, to um, Sariah, who's going to Babylon. And this is what we saw last week, where he said, carry this scroll about the destruction of Babylon, and you read it there in Babylon. And when you read it, tie a stone to it, and you throw it in the Euphrates River, and that scroll will just go down to the bottom. And then all, everybody's watching, that scroll is not going to pop back up. And so the point of all that is Babylon is falling. Babylon's going down to the bottom of, of the, the river. But look at verse 64. So you say that, and then the last sentence to this point are the words of Jeremiah, or your translation, maybe a better way to translate it is uh, the words of Jeremiah are ended. And so what do we have in chapter 52? It seems we have not the words of Jeremiah, but perhaps the words of a scribe, and that scribe is Baruch, maybe but are the narrator of this. And uh, he describes what has happened. And in chapter 52, he didn't shed any tears. He, uh, he just reported what happened. He's a historian. He's just given the facts. Now, next week we'll see from Lamentations that that's the poet, that's Jeremiah, and there are tears that run. There. It's, a, it's not called Lamentations for nothing. It's a lament. You know, he's crying over all of this. And so in chapter 52, his report here is that when Jerusalem fell in the year 586 BC, it was dethroned, they took the king away, it was demolished, they came in, burned down the temple, all the buildings, the, the whole Jerusalem. It was desecrated because they went into the temple area and it was depopulated because they carried, him off in, uh, carried the people off into captivity. Um, I, I usually don't like alliteration, and that's not from me, it's from somebody else, but I thought they at least put, put it real well. Dethroned, demolished, desecrated, and depopulated. And that's what this chapter is about. And it begins in, in verses 1 through 11 with an act of the rebellion of the king. Um, you look at verses 1 and 2 that we saw there. Zedekiah, is, is, uh, he's the king, and he's, he, uh, is, um, he's reigned in Jerusalem for 11 years, and um, 30, what, uh, 21, 31, 32 years old. And uh, his mother is given, and then verse 2 is the statement about him. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. And verse 3, because of the anger of the Lord, this, what, this, this whole thing that chapter 52 is about, this came in Jerusalem. It came about in Jerusalem. Until he, that's God, drove them, that's the people, from his face, from his presence, out from his, his presence. You, know, you um, Look at the record, the Babylonians came in and Jeremiah repeatedly begged Zedekiah to surrender to the Babylonians. This is back in chapter 37. But 
he, he was so prideful, he wouldn't do that. He's fearful, he wouldn't do that. And so the Babylonian army marched on the city to teach him a lesson. Look at verse 4. It came about in the ninth year of his reign, on the tenth day of the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came, he and all his army, against Jerusalem. They camped against it. And they built these siege, this siege work, this siege ramp. And what that was, and there's still, there's still evidence of, of siege ramps in Jerusalem, not or in, um, in Israel, the land of Israel, not in Jerusalem. But, uh, for instance, down around Masada, they come in, they just haul in buckets and buckets and buckets of dirt and build a ramp up to a city and then put wooden planks on that. And then they had these um, battering rams that are on wheels and they would roll it up. And the battering ram hang from, uh, hung from ropes and they roll it up to the walls and then just back and forth, back and forth just constantly, 24 hours a day, battering on the walls. And there would be people in there and they're covered up because usually soldiers in the city are shooting arrows down at the people who are doing this. But that goes on and on and on and on and the end of the battering ram had metal on it and then just break the whole wall in. And they kept pounding on the walls of Jerusalem until it collapsed. And you can imagine how desperate things were inside the city as that constantly is going on and they've shut off everything to the city. Lamentation says that because of thirst, the infant's tongue sticks to the roof of its mouth. The children beg for bread and no one gives it to them. That's, the, that's what the poet says in Lamentations. The historian puts it more matter-of-factly, look at verse 6 here in chapter 52. On the ninth day of the fourth month, the famine was so severe in the city that there was no food for the people of the land. No food. The food ran out. And just as the food ran out, the Babylonians broke through the wall. Look at verse 7 again. Then the city was breached, and all the warriors fled and left the city at night by way of the gate between the two walls just by the king's garden. Though the Chaldeans, that's the Babylonians, were all around the city. They, they went by way of the Aravah. They managed to slip through. So you see the courage of the soldiers now. And they broke the wall down and the Babylonians are coming in and so the soldiers just fled. And the Babylonian army pursued the soldiers and pursued the king. And they overtook him. Uh, verse 8 the army of the Chaldeans pursued the king, overtook Zedekiah in the des desert plains of Jericho, and all his army was scattered from him. Then they captured the king, brought him up to the king of Babylon at Rivlah. That's where the king of Nebuchadnezzar is sitting. And it's like a base camp. In the, and he passed sentence on him. And the king of Babylon slaughtered the sons of Zedekiah before his eyes. That's the last thing he sees. And he also slaughtered all the commanders of Judah, in Rivla. Then he blinded the eyes of Zedekiah, and the king of Babylon bound him with bronze shackles and brought him to Babylon and put him in prison until the day of his death. So what happened to the kingdom? It's demolished. It's, uh, the king is, is taken in chains to Babylon. And it says on the tenth day of the month, if you look at verses 12 through 14, so the 19th year of King Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And notice it keeps mentioning king of Babylon, king of Babylon. If, you, if we're readers, we're reading this, we know Nebuchadnezzar is king of Babylon. I mean, how many times do you need to be told that? But it's emphasizing the king, the king of Babylon is coming in and he took this city. Nebuzaradan, the captain of the bodyguard, verse 12, who was in the service of the king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and he burned the house of the Lord the king's house, all the houses of Jerusalem, even every large house he burned with fire. So the entire army of the Chaldeans who were with the captain of the guard tore down all the walls around Jerusalem. And archaeologists have done work in this area and they, there's, there's, even, there's evidence that Jerusalem has been burned at this point. And evidence that, I mean, the wealthy people of Jerusalem had some real nice houses. And there's evidence that those houses were destroyed. And he burned the temple down to the ground. And 
it torches all the important buildings. And you just think of a beautiful city and then an army coming in and just completely burning that city down. That was what happened in, in Jerusalem. The fire spread and there would be fires just you know, constantly burning. Then they desecrated the temple uh, in uh, verses 17 through 23. It tells us all these different articles. The bronze pillars which belonged to the house of the Lord. The stands, the bronze sea which were in the house of the Lord. The Chaldeans smashed to pieces and carried all their bronze to Babylon. They also took the pots, the shovels, the basins, the pans, all these, these bronze vessels. They, they took bowls, fire pans, pots, lamp stands, drink offering bowls, whatever was fine gold, whatever was fine silver. Also it says in verse 20, the two pillars, the one sea, the twelve bronze bulls. This is some heavy stuff. Which were under the sea and the stands which Solomon had made for the house of the Lord. The bronze of all these vessels was, was beyond weight, the text says. And then he, he gives some references there. All these uh, articles were used for, for lighting lamps, tending the altars, uh, making various sacrifices, all the temple furnishings that are here. And the inventory is right down to the last pomegranate because it's written by a historian. He's listing all of this. Now they had looted the temple before in 597, but then there was just too much to carry. Uh, this time, in addition to the gold and the silver, they carry all this back. The, you know, more bronze that's beyond that you could even weigh, as the text says. The bronze sea, there's no telling what that weighed. must have been tons. I mean, you think about it, it held uh, 10,000 gallons of water, and it's made out of bronze. It's about eight foot tall and uh, 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 about 15 feet wide. So that's a pretty big thing, full of, you know, you got to do something with the water. It's all solid bronze. So they came in, they just tore everything up and carry all these articles. And he takes, uh, in verses 24 through 27, the chief priest and all the priests and rank the doorkeepers. He takes all of those off as prisoners to Babylon. And they want cheap labor, so they're bringing the people as well. And this begins the 70 years that was prophesied they'd be in slavery. Give verses 15 and 16. Now, Buzaradan, the captain of the guard, took into exile some of the poorest of the people, the rest of the people who were left in the city, the deserters who had deserted to the king of Babylon, the rest of the craftsmen. But Nebuzaradan, the captain of the guard, left some of the poorest of the land to be vine dressers and farmers. And the writer even, I mean, he's recording. This is like official records. And so as a historian, he's recording all this. Verses 28 through 30, these are the people whom Nebuchadnezzar took into exile. In the seventh year, 3,023 Jews. In the 18th year, Nebuchadnezzar eight, took 823 Jews people. Verse 30, in the 23rd year, 745 Jewish people. And so there are 4,600 people in all. And these totals are, are a little bit smaller than what we have in the book of Kings, Second Kings. They probably only include the adult males. Uh, and the remnant of all that were carried off into to slavery, probably 20,000 or so went. Now, those are the facts, and the writer here just records the facts. They came in, broke the walls down, burned the temple, burned the whole city, carried off and killed the, the officials, carried the poorest people because they're going to be slaves in Babylon. So what do all these facts mean? There's spiritual lessons from this. One lesson is that God will punish the guilty. That's what we've been seeing over and over and over. Look at verse 3. This was a part of our Bible reading. For because of the anger of the Lord, this came about in Jerusalem and Judah. Exodus 34, 7. God does not leave the guilty unpunished. 
God punishes the guilty. The key to interpreting all of the, this here in chapter 52 is verse 3. It's because of the anger of the Lord. We don't have to wonder, why did this happen? Well, they didn't put enough money in their military and they weren't able to, to oppose them and all of that. And that's not the reason that's given. The reason is given because of the anger of the Lord. And the anger of the Lord was because of their sin, as Scripture so, shows. And notice he says, he cast his people, he drove them from his presence. To stand in the presence of God is one of the greatest blessings that a believer can, can have. In Psalm 27 and verse 4, uh, the psalmist says, One thing I've asked of the Lord, and this is what I seek, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze on the beauty of the Lord and to seek Him in His temple. To be in His presence. And now God says He cast them out of His presence. Why? Because they didn't listen to Him. They're sinners. He's holy. He warned them over and over. He sent Jer Jeremiah. He sent all these other prophets. And they wouldn't listen. I mean, that's what we have in the, the book of Jeremiah. He preaches against all... All these sin. He said enemies will come from the north. They're going to destroy the temple. He prophesied they'd surround Jerusalem. He told about the famine that was coming. He told about the death that would come. He warned that they would loot the temple. Nearly every verse in Jeremiah 52 is fulfilled prophecy of what Jeremiah's prophesied in the rest of the book, preceding this, this book. One person said reading Jeremiah 52 is a good way to review the entire book of Jeremiah. Because this is what Jeremiah said will happen, and it happened. He spoke the true words of God. Now, you can imagine as the citizens of Jerusalem look at their city, and it's just burning down around them, that they would have thought of Jeremiah's prophecies. And they should have recognized that they brought this on themselves. And this is, stands as a warning for us the Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans chapter 6. It promises that there is a judgment that is coming when Christ returns in power and might. It tells us that as humans we're destined to die once and after that to face judgment, Hebrews 9. It warns us that the enemies of God will be banished from His presence forevermore in Matthew 25. Paul told the Thessalonians, you know full well the day of the Lord is coming. It will come like a thief in the night, he says. While people are saying safety, it comes. So what he means is they're not ready for it. But then Paul tells the Thessalonians, that day doesn't need to overtake you as a thief because you can be ready. You don't know when he's coming. We don't set days and dates, but we know he is coming. And if he is coming, we're ready. He may come today. And I know, you know, we hear preachers say that, but do we really think that's a real possibility? He can come today. And the question is, are we ready when he comes? Might not be today, maybe next week, maybe a thousand years, we don't know. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 28, Christ was sacrificed one time to take away the sins of the people. He will appear a second time not to bear sin, but to bring salvation to those who are waiting for Him. So are we in that group of those who are waiting for Him? He's not coming again to die for sin. He did that one time. So the, the fall of Jerusalem teaches us God will punish the guilty. Another lesson it teaches that we must remain faithful to God. This, these are God's people and God warned them, and they didn't listen, and they weren't faithful. And so judgment came to them. Jeremiah warned it could happen. You know, early on in the book, um, they're at the temple. Jeremiah preaches a sermon at the temple, chapter 7. And he said, go to Shiloh. Go to Shiloh and see what happened over there. And what happened over there is Shiloh is where God had a dwelling, and it's now destroyed. The Philistines came in and did that. And Jeremiah said, you say you're trusting in the temple? Same thing is going to happen right here that happened to Shiloh. You're trusting in this? 
You need to trust in the Lord. Now, is there any hope from this? God will hold the guilty accountable, and we must remain faithful to God. This seems just bad news. I mean, you're seeing right here, <clears throat> Jeremiah, this is really negative, bad news. Is there any hope? Can, can anything be done about this? There is some hope here in this last chapter. There is hope of a return. One um, scholar says, in its present context, this chapter seems to say the divine word both has been fulfilled and will be fulfilled. Jeremiah's word is fulfilled, but it will be fulfilled in that there's hope that's offered. There's some hope in the list of all the items that are, are here. It's an inventory. We're not going to go and read all this, but after they spent roughly 70 years in Babylon, they're going to return under Ezra and Nehemiah. In Ezra chapter 1, there's an inventory. Gold dishes, 30. Silver dishes, 1,000. Because he needs to know what we're carrying back to restore the temple. Gold bowl, silver pans, 29. Gold bowls, 30. Matching silver bowls, 410. Other articles, 1,000. They had this list. And they could look at this chapter here and know. And Ezra weighed out the gold and, and the silver. So temple worship was restored just like Jeremiah prophesied. Now, there's a greater hope that's in this chapter, and that's a hope of a king who will once again come to God's city. And it's in the closing verses here of the entire book of Jeremiah. It has, I mean, it's very negative, but it has a hopeful ending. Look at verses 31 through the end of the book. Jeremiah 52, 31. Now, it came about in the 37th year of the exile of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, in the 12th month, on the 25th of the month. So he's been in slavery 37 years. That Ewil Merodach, that's spelled E-V-I-L, but that's not evil. It's not that he's a real evil guy, and that becomes his name. This is a Babylonian name, Ewil Merodach. King of Babylon, he succeeded Nebuchadnezzar. In the first year of his reign, showed favor to Jehoiakim, king of Judah, and brought him out of prison. Spent 37 years in slavery. This Now this Babylonian king, Ewil Merodach, shows favor and brings him out of prison. Then he spoke kindly to him and set his throne above the thrones of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So Jehoiakim changed his prison clothes and had his meals in the king's presence regularly all the days of his life. And as his allowance, a regular allowance was given to him by the king of Babylon, a portion for each day, all the days of his life until the day of his death. He's... he's was a prisoner. Now he's set free. He's eating with the king. Now, and he has portion. And, and uh, even he has this special portion every day. And there are documents that that were recorded in Babylon, and those documents have been found, and it has his name on those documents, his ration documents. Now you might think, well, that just that, that's encouraging. But what does it what does it mean? What what does it mean to me? I mean, it'd be a good way, you know, for a movie to end or something. Well, he's getting out of prison now. It's greater than Jehoiakim. I'll tell you that. And it's important because Jehoiakim was David's rightful heir. Jeremiah had said God would put a son of David on the throne. And it's not looking just to Jehoiakim. It's looking beyond Jehoiakim. And in the Gospel of Matthew, let's go over there in Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to close with this. Matthew chapter 1. And you have this genealogy. Verse 12. And I know, and maybe you're going to resolve the first of the year, read the New Testament through. And I'm just like you. We get to these names and we just kind of bog down. And all these names. And we say, what does all this mean? Verse 12, after the deportation to Babylon, so 
Nebuchadnezzar came in, carried them off to Babylon. They stayed there roughly 70 years. After the deportation to Babylon, Yekaniah fathered Shealtel, Shealtel fathered Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel fathered Avihud, Avihud fathered uh, Eliakim, Eliakim fathered Azor, Azor fathered Zadok, Zadok fathered Akim, Akim fathered Elihud, Elihud fathered Eliezer, Eliezer fathered Matan, Matan fathered Jacob, Jacob fathered Joseph, the husband of Mary, by whom Jesus was born, who is called the Messiah. That in verse um, in verse twelve, the first person mentioned there, Yekaniah, is another name for Yehoiakim. And so, in the genealogy of Jesus, here is Yehoiakim. What happened to Yehoiakim? He spent 37 years in slavery and the king of Babylon shows him kindness and he's now eating at the king's table. The line of David is preserved down through these years and Messiah comes in the line of David. Now that's, Jeremiah chapter 52 is, is bad news, is negative news, but for those who are believers in Messiah, that's good news. That, it ends right there on that high point that Jeconiah, or uh, Jehoiakim, is eating at the king's table as a free man. And that leads to the Messiah, and that leads to the gospel, that he died for our sins. So there's a good ending for believers in the Messiah. Number 95 is the invitation song, and its burdens are lifted at Calvary, and they're lifted at Calvary by the death of Messiah. His line was preserved and he came and Christ fulfilled all those prophecies and he went to the cross and he took upon himself sin, but not his sin, our sin. He died for our sins that we might be saved. If you're not a Christian this morning, the gospel invitation is, here's the good news. He died for your sins. He calls you to turn to him, put your faith in him, confessing his name, being baptized, your sins are washed away. You, if you've done that and you've wandered away and you might think well I'm, I'm God's person uh, people of Judah said they were God's person they didn't listen to God and judgment came so and we plead with you as the writers of scripture do put your trust in God live faithfully for him we're here to help you in any way and we're praying if you need to come you'll do that while we stand and sing the song